Good afternoon, Santa Clarita, and welcome to the Action Drug Hour here at um, your hometown station, 98.1 and 1220 AM, your hometown station. It's good to be here. So um, I got my friend, Shelly, here today, and she's um, with Grief Recovery mm -hmm. up here in Santa Clarita. And the reason why I asked her here is the last couple, the last show I did was very sad and... and um, and and almost normal to me, because I, everywhere around me this last year, there's death, dying, and grief, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of one of those kind of things that um, I try to do positive shows too, and I bring a lot of success stories here because we have a lot of successes, but when it comes right down to it, you don't hear about the successes as much as you hear about the people you lose, right? You know, and I'm so freaking tired of losing people and uh, it, it's just a sad deal um it's always been bad when it comes to drugs but nothing is worse than it is today i mm -hmm. mean right when the pandemic and i say this all the time but right before the pandemic came and anytime you turn on the tv it was an opioid epidemic and people were panicked and uh big pharmacal uh, pharma farm was getting sued and um, everywhere you looked it was talking about opioids and overdoses and then the then the pandemic came and everybody stopped talking about everything mm -hmm. except for COVID. Yeah. But that doesn't mean everything stopped. Everything um, actually got worse. People that hang had anxiety had more anxiety. People that drank, drank more. People who used drugs used more drugs. People that were suicidal became more suicidal. Mm -hmm. People that were depressed and lonely became more depressed and lonely. So we went into a real crisis. And you know what, what they didn't do well? when they decided to put us on lockdown, was think about the mental health and think about the people that were drinking or, or sitting at home alone not knowing how to deal with life. Not that they could have done anything different, but it's just we're suffering, um, we're suffering from that. Mm -hmm. The substance abuse got worse, as we know. The alcohol got worse. The depression got worse. And mental health in general got worse. There were more suicidal stuff coming out, more um, domestic violence coming, more child abuse and everything else. Um, and then all of a sudden, we'll go back to the drugs for a second. As, as we know, that we talked about about a minute ago, is we had a crisis with opiates. So what happened? The DEA got involved, and, every, and the doctors got involved, and the medical association got involved, and everybody says, well, okay, we're not writing prescriptions anymore. And bang, it stopped. Just like that. So everybody that had a use for some kind of pain medication used to go to the doctor and they would get 90 pills and three refills and went away. The dealers that were able to get drugs, they were sending people doctor shopping to different doctors. It went away. A new program came in called the CARE program, meaning if I went to the doctor and I hit the, uh, asked the doctor for a prescription, he'd go on a computer and he would know or she would know every prescription I've ever gotten. So that went away. So the supply was gone, just like that. And the demand was higher than ever before, which then opened the door for fentanyl. And mm -hmm. fentanyl came into this country um, full speed ahead. We did a good job of kind of detouring it, but it went straight to Mexico. And where Mexico, they're just bootlegging it in everything. Every pill, the DEA will tell you 100% of pills out there today are fake. I'll say 99.9% .9 of the pills are fake, which means they're fentanyl. Every drug that is out there today that we're testing people for, meaning crystal meth, um, cocaine, um, even sometimes even in THC, we're finding traces of fentanyl. So it's just completely off the hook. I'm involved in a lot of sites right now, and on these sites, it's, it's about people that are losing people to, to fentanyl. And it's every day, and there's more and more and more. It's, they say it's the number one killer for people from 18 to 45. I'll say more like 16 to 45. Mm -hmm. I know quite a few people that had children they found in their rooms dead. Wow. And that's where most of these kids are being found, in, their, in the safest place in the world, in their bedrooms. So, and, and it can be bought on Snapchat. It can be delivered to your house. Even the people that were using drugs that needed the drugs Mm -hmm. had to go to the streets because doctors wouldn't write them for them. So it became a real, I mean, serious epidemic, I'll call it a pandemic, the biggest one we ever had. 
and um, it's it's just terrible. We're treating people today with two different kinds of addicts. One that is somebody that you know they broke their contracts, they smoked weed, they drank, they ended up using other drugs, and it went on down the line. And then we're treating the accidental addicts that were mm-hmm. that actually had surgeries and got hooked on them that way, and they're now using fentanyl. And fentanyl is, let's, let's look at it this way: if you're baking chocolate chip cookies and you put too much chocolate chips, they're yummy. If you're cooking up fentanyl and you put too much fentanyl in a batch, they're deadly. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're having what you call mass overdoses, meaning one batch can kill many people because they're, they're mixed wrong. And these are not chemists that are making these pills. So over 100,000 people died from um, accidental overdoses due to this drug in the last 12 months. Over 100,000. Can you imagine if 100,000 people were shot on the streets every year? And that's, so let's put it to you this way. That's just for overdoses by accident. You can add the sexual abuse, the domestic violence, the hit and runs, the car accidents, the, the murders, the robberies. And it, I mean, it's just the number one pandemic. It's bigger than anything we ever had before. But then I'm dealing with so many. This is where you come in, Shelly. I need your help. Because I'm dealing with so many parents and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts that are calling me, and they're just so freaking devastated, man. They don't know how to, how to go on. You know, I look at my Facebook, and it's the same people. They post the same. They post different pictures of their families every day of their children, and it, it breaks my heart. So I want to kind of give them some kind of hope, you know. And I know that's what you do, and I know I know you. Actually, before you were a grief recovery. <laughs> expert mm-hmm. or counselor because I know I know your story. Mm-hmm. So would you like to introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit why, you, why you're doing what you're doing and then we could get into advice. Absolutely. And thank you so much for inviting me to come in. And when it comes to grief recovery or grief groups, I would not invite anyone else but you. Oh, thank you. I have extremely, uh, I, I have a lot of respect and, and I believe in what you do. Thank you very much. And there is no doubt that a Pandora's box has been open oh. long ago with all of this. And it, it is heartbreaking. And really, it's just, there's a loss for words I know. to, to I know. what's going on. And, um, and losing a child, I, it's mm. just, it's absolutely horrific. And it's, a, it's an every single day deal now yeah i mean every time because i'm involved in all these drug sites and all i mean every day somebody's posting my god i lost my kid it's been three months and i mean it's just on and on and on and it's it's just terrible man yeah breaks my heart and it is and and i agree with you it is getting younger (laughs) and with uh whether it's uh suicide ideation suicide Mm -hmm. uh, i mean you're hearing you know children like 10 and you know overdoses accidental over it's it it really is difficult to wrap our mind around. I don't think of what's happening. This, I don't think. The, I mean, we're just now figuring. I've been saying for the last couple of years, this is going to dominate the news. It's going to take over all the headlines. And it's going to kill more people. It's now dominating the news, mm-hmm. and it's killing more people mm-hmm. because I'm in the business for 40 years. Mm-hmm. I could see it coming. Right. You know, but there's. And if you look at drugs today, there is no safe drug. It's no. in everything. I was admitted somebody to uh, my the action drug rehab um, on Friday, and this poor girl says, "You know what? I've been using methamphetamine, but every time I use it, I'm nodding out. Mm-hmm. You don't nod out using meth. It's a speed. It's an amphetamine. You nod out because they cut it with fentanyl. And then guess what? I'm having to detox her for now. Not crystal meth, fentanyl. Wow. Because she is physically and emotionally addicted to fentanyl using crystal meth." Mm-hmm. But that's the kind of deals that I'm dealing with right now. I got this little 19-year-old girl at my office that was um, Narcan back to life, I think, four times. Wow. 19 years old. So, yes, we're in the midst of a pretty terrible crisis. Mm-hmm. That's why I asked you here. So kind of let us know who you are and why you're doing what you're doing, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, well, my story, I never would have thought I would be doing what I'm doing now. Um, I... Uh, Lost my husband in 2017. Uh, He left behind a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, and we were together for almost 28 years. And uh, and he unfortunately took his life. Um, So sad. And it was it was one of those things, you know. We always say that we never expected, and how could that person? And uh, he was the life of the party, and always happy, and. 
Um, yeah, so it was very shocking, and especially to have known him since right. I was 13. Yeah, he, he was, was your, your your first love. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And uh, and he was a very intentional father, and uh, this is not it was not what he wanted, that's for sure. So uh, it absolutely destroyed me. Uh, I had really, when people say, you know, how do you do it? Well, you really don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, not when you have you know, other lives involved and, um, yeah, yeah. You, that must've been terrible because you had young children mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. 12 and, and 14. If I remember Such correct, crucial ages. If I, you don't mind if I talk about oh, it. No, no, yeah, no, no. If I remember correctly, you came home and found them. Yes. But, it, mm -hmm. but, but he also, you were leaving and you gave him a kiss goodbye and said, I love you. And he yep. said, I love you. And mm -hmm. you had no idea what he was going to do. No idea. No. And, and that's pretty normal for suicide. If somebody really, really, really wants mm -hmm. to die, they might leave clues and they might leave none because mm -hmm. right. they already surrendered to the fact that that's what they're going to do. Right, right. And, you know, it, it is interesting because, you know, you look back and, you know, now I when I walked through that moment over and over and over again, now I can kind of pick up on, oh, my gosh, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? How did I miss that? And, and it does put this burden on you that you did something wrong. But, I mean, the truth is... There's no way I, you, you, no way you see it in the moment. You just don't. And I think that puts a lot on people who do survive things like this because everyone's like, well, didn't you see something? Didn't you know something? There's always signs. It's like, but you never really think this could possibly really happen. The guy, he gave you a kiss goodbye. Yeah. And yeah. you came home and, and, yeah. and found him. Well, yeah. And I was promised that the next 30 years were going to be the best years. You know I mean, and, and there's betrayal in that, <laughs> you know, you there, there's, yeah. yeah, you know, and because you trust someone that they're going to tell you if they're not okay. Right. You know, you know, he was like, we've gone through all of this. You're going to let me know. And, and if you're not told, I mean, things do kind of slip through. And I did, I felt like, uh, I felt like he slipped through my grasp and, and I was responsible for it. But the truth is, I was not responsible no, for it. No, but isn't that what we always yeah, say? We always if do. I would have done different, yeah. better, or more. And we, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's what, you know, obviously what grief is. Mm -hmm. You know, the lost dreams, hopes, and expectations, and how we wish we could have done things different, better, or more. And especially with parents. I mean, we do. We think uh, we're taught to protect our children all the time. And we're protecting them in the womb. We're protecting them from crossing the street. We're protecting them from touching the stove. Mm. And then it comes to this point where they we kind of- We child-proof the house. Child we the put house. locks on the cabinets right. and all that stuff, right? And now, and now we just have this thing called grief that just kind of comes in. And, and especially with addiction and uh, a lot of people, of the reason why they're turning to drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. and self-medicating. Right, uh, it's some kind of trauma or trauma grief. There's trauma and grief, yeah, exactly. absolutely. And, it usually, and it's accumulative. Right. It starts early on, and our children are no different, especially, like you said, during the pandemic. Mm. Uh, one moment, you know, we're right prior to the pandemic, we're telling kids to get outside, get off your media, and go have fun and interact with people. And then overnight, don't go outside, don't interact with people. There's a curfew. There's Restaurants a curfew. are closing, everyone inside. Everyone like, wow. has to stay home in whatever environment they're in, which a lot of them are probably not good environments. Mm -hmm. And and if they weren't good environments before the pandemic, you can bet there weren't any better during it. Right, and the stresses. And then now they have endless time of just isolating themselves on their phones, being able to research anything and everything, Mm. And, you know, it's no longer the strangers and the, and the fear is outside the home. It's right in your home. Yeah. Under, I mean, you could be sitting with your child and you have no idea, even yeah. with all the little safety measures you put in. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy because maybe the pandemic changed it a little bit. But before the pandemic and even during the pandemic, the average parent has literally spends between two and ten minutes with their children, teenagers a day. Right. And here's how it goes today, back, they're back in school. But what's the last thing you think an adolescent does before they go to sleep? Very last thing. Look at their phone. They pick up their phone and they check out their social media mm -hmm. and they're on Snapchat or whatever it is, Instagram, and they're saying uh, goodnight to their friends. And then they wake up in the morning. What's the first thing they do before they even go to the bathroom? Pick up their phone. They take their phone into the bathroom. Yeah, take the phone with them, <laughs> right. or either that, or, or and they're checking out their their Insta, their, right. their, their social media. So they go to sleep with their friends, and now they wake up with them. Hey guys, how are you? That kind of thing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. 
and then they come out. Maybe mom's still there, and, and they say, "Hey, mom, going to school." And they, that's about a thirty-second thing, unless you drive them. And then they, they're at school, and then with who? Their friends again. So then they, so now they go to sleep with them. They wake up with them. They go to school with them. They're there six or eight hours, and they come home. If mom and dad are living together, they're probably both working or something. Right. So who's waiting for them? When I when I ask that question, a lot of times people say, "Nobody." That's such crap. Mm -hmm. They're friends, either in person. Right. For in person. Right. So they so now mom or dad comes home if they're living together. And don't forget this is California divorce capital of the world. And mom or dad comes home and says, Hey Shelly, how was your day? It was good. How was school? It was okay. You have any homework? I done it. Are you hungry? I ate. Mm hmm And they go back to their room and what are they doing? Going on their phones. Get back on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So the crazy thing thing is if they're that connected to their friends they're not connected to their parents anymore which means their friends and bad choices and decisions are a whole lot easier to do than ever before in history because now the guilt's not there because they're connected over here not over here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's it's just everything's kind of tragic go to a restaurant and watch people eating Mom's t taking pictures. I say this every week, though. On whatever, whatever show I'm doing, I say something like this. Mom's t looking at her Facebook to see how many likes she got for the chocolate cake on the table. Mm -hmm. you know, kids are texting or whatever their friends, and their dad's in space. So even yeah. when we're together, we're not together. It's, you know, in parents, we only have a small window of influence of our children. Because uh, then once they get, you know, pretty much middle school, high school, and now especially with the phones, mm -hmm. uh, it happens much sooner. Now, that doesn't mean that children aren't still paying attention to their parents. Right. I mean, we, we still kind of have a subconscious which influence. Is, which is good and bad because yeah. do what I say, not what I do. Right. doesn't work. Right. I mean, if you want your kids to do right, do right. Absolutely. If you want your kids to not drink, don't drink. Right. If you want your kids not to scream and yell and cuss somebody out because they cut you off, don't do it. Right. And they still find a way to do those things. Even if you try to do everything right, well, they peer can pressure. still, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, you know. But you know what I hear all the time is, is a lot of, I'm dealing with a lot of youngsters and because they're so disconnected from their families, they don't really have time to grieve anything mm -hmm. or to deal with any trauma that they have because if there's a trauma in the house, everybody goes about doing it diff different right. and separate. Yeah. So they don't talk about grandma that died. Mm -hmm. Mom's over there crying and dealing with her thing and the mm -hmm. kids are in their room. So they're learning or not learning how to deal with their feelings by themselves. Right. And that's a big deal because grief is uh, normal and it's a natural part of life. It is what we go through uh, when we are facing any significant emotional loss. Give us give us some examples. Well, grief, you know, when we think of grief, everyone tends to just immediately go to death. Right. But grief is trauma and uh, loss of health and hope and abuse, loss of time, getting mm -hmm. over an addiction, moving, finances, changing moving, address. changes addresses. You know that's one of the top five for um, suicide? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. changing of address. Wow. Yeah. It's true. I mean, yeah. One of the top five reasons used to be anyways. I, don't, I, I haven't checked the data lately, but it was. Mm -hmm. You know, separations, divorces. Isolation. Uh, Breakups. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Changes of address, loss of job, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But that's all grief. All grief. So w when we come back from break, let's talk a little bit about the different types of grief and, and uh, the... Um, what is the word I was going to say? The the rumor that um, time heals all. Mm, How's that sound? I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why I said You're that. Right. So mm -hmm. we can talk about that when we come back. Shelly is um, with Grief Recovery, mm -hmm. and she's up here, and she's uh, does a lot of help for a lot of people that's in trouble with grief. And um, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Action Drug Rehab Hour here on um, Ba, ba, ba. Look at that! I'm kind of I'm, I'm so into this grief talk that I'm, I'm forgetting where I'm going. But I'm on KHTS and your hometown station, my hometown station, and um, we're talk. I'm talking with Shelly. Shelly is an expert in grief recovery, and um, we were talking during break on where you want to go now mm -hmm. because I really want this to be your show mm -hmm. today because you're the expert mm -hmm. on grief recovery. So, oh, it, it, okay. 
I did go through the same training, <laughs> but that was 25 years ago. So I forgot more than I remember. How's that? Well, but it's nice because we were speaking the same language. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah, we were discussing you know, all the different types of grief and kind of going back to how I ended up coming into doing this kind right. of work. And uh, previously, um, yeah, I went to regular counseling, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. It was extremely helpful. Uh, but a lot of it was the same, you know, the time heals all wounds and, you know, just talk about it. And, um, it was kind of lackadaisy and I noticed that I just kept talking about the same thing over and over and over again. And, uh, then I had a friend that introduced me into uh, someone who did, uh, the grief recovery method and, and, and that's where it really kind of changed me because I'm like all of those myths and things that we hear about, again, Time heals all wounds. No, it's it's the combination of action and time. Right. Yeah. And, and it and that doesn't mean time fixes it. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, look at a flat tire. I can stare at that flat tire forever. It's not going to change anything. In fact, it's just going to get worse in many occasions. But it's the action of putting air in the tire. And depending right. on how flat that tire is, it's going to take more action of putting air in the tire. Right. So... And there's also, what's also very sad to me is uh, when they make it seem like grief, that it is this thing that will just keep you stuck in misery forever. And Well, it does feel like oh, absolutely. The, in the beginning, it's like oh, you, absolutely. You, you're in this dark cloud and you could see over there is light, but you don't know how to get there. Oh, I would even say that it reminds me of like the black hole in space. Right. I mean, no light can get in the black hole. Right. So when you're going through a loss and, and a tragedy and uh, especially something that's uh, instantaneous that just throws you, uh, people can be telling you that the sun is there, but if you're in that black hole, you don't see it. You don't, see it, you don't believe it. And so the sun is like hope. Right. And But when you're in that black hole, there's no way... You the, can see it. The pain is so horrible. Absolutely. That you just don't know how to get out of it, right. and you question yourself for everything, mm -hmm. and you think you're going to feel that terrible gut-wrenching mm -hmm. um, misery forever. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, you know, I, I've worked with some people that when they go and share their story, uh, there was one person I'm thinking of, and it had been like 25 years. When they shared their story, it was as if no time had passed. They were feeling exactly what they felt, and that was how they've been feeling their whole life. And the reason why is they could, they believed that that's how they were supposed to be. Right. And that's, I mean, I deal with this all the time. Yeah. When, when somebody says, I lost my son and mm -hmm. I can't go on in life, I said, well, your son would want more for you than that. Right. Your son loves you enough to say it's time for life for the living. Right. And, and there's definitely a time and a season to uh, be in that anguish and to have that support because mm -hmm. you do need to have people come around you and hold you and pull you mm -hmm. when you're going through that. But isn't so many people so if they don't know what to say, so they, they try to back off too. Yes, they absolutely back off. And sometimes they say, you know, really hurtful unhelpful things which we all have get over it <laughs> you know, you'll, yeah. get, you'll feel better yeah, if, if, yeah. yeah um and it's and it's really because we just don't know what to say oh uh, uh, western culture does not handle grief well mm. uh eastern culture tends to be uh very more showy with their feelings and very more symbolic and and we kind of do little symbolisms but we're pretty much like you know bring the lasagnas for a couple of weeks the body's done and right, right, move right, on right. a few months and anyone who's lost somebody knows that it's a couple of months after is when yep you're just now the dust and debris is starting to settle right and everyone else has moved on you imagine when you're young and either your parents get a divorce mm -hmm. Or you fell in love for the first time and you're 13 and all of a sudden the relationship falls apart and parents say to their kids things like, it's just infatuation. No, it's love on, spero on steroids. Mm -hmm. When you're that young and you feel that, that much for somebody and all of a sudden it's gone, the loss is so bad, the grief is so bad that it's almost like you lost somebody forever. Well, it is. Oh, absolutely. Well, and another thing with you know our youth is 
I mean, if you think how difficult it is for us as adults when we go through loss, I mean, it could mm. just, it could be devastating. We figure, how do we do this? And, and it does seem so permanent. Uh, but with our youth, they have no experience to fall back on. Right. So when we tell them, you know, you will get past this, you will meet someone else, mm. it won't always feel this way, they'll just kind of nod their head or look at you with that, you know, yep. empty stare because they don't have the experience to see that that's true. Right. We have the experience and it's still difficult for us. And we still question it. Uh-huh. Am I ever going to get through right. this? Is this am I going to feel this way forever? Am I in that black hole in the middle and, of and space? And we have exactly. experience. Imagine we, these youth that don't they, have that. They don't have they, they have no idea how to no. deal with those feelings. No. Now take somebody that's been drinking or using drugs. And when you start drinking or using drugs, you stop emotionally growing when it comes to feeling stuff. Absolutely. So that means as you grow up, well, you know what? When somebody's getting clean or sober in my rehab, we don't have to teach them how not to use drugs. Don't use drugs. Pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. What happens is a feeling comes up. And when the feeling comes up, the obsession to use comes up because they don't know how to deal with that feeling. Right. So they run to their coping mechanism, which is the alcohol or mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, we took that away from them. So they not only are they grieving the alcohol or drugs, they don't know how to deal with their feelings. Right. And we've been told that we are only supposed to really have positive, happy feelings. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to obtain this level of joy and happiness, and we just stay there. Right. And the thing that we need to remember and, and teach not just our youth but everyone that it's normal to feel depressed when you're depressed. It's normal to feel sad and hurt and angry. Those are all normal, natural human emotions. And to fully experience the positive emotions, we have to be able to feel yeah. those dark, horrible things. And, and, and that's normal to feel. There's nothing wrong with you right. if you are feeling those feelings. But we must find ways to cope through them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are not teaching that. That's, what's, that's what really is um, scaring me now, and I'll tell you why. Because I know many people that lost children mm -hmm. and or family members, and they're Facebook friends of mine, and I'm watching their Facebooks, mm -hmm. and I understand what they're doing, and I would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're posting little things every day or pictures or something, and that's a great way to mm -hmm. deal with it. But it just, it, what, do I, what do we say to them? Because mm -hmm. I could feel their pain every time I go to my Facebook. Right. I feel their pain. Well, as grievers want to be heard, they want to sit. Say that again. Grievers want to be heard. Do you all hear that? They want to share. They want to talk about it over and over and over again. Sometimes they have to because speaking it out loud, it's so hard for them to believe it's real mm -hmm. that they kind of have to say it over and over again. Like, is this really happening? And there's all these things we don't think It's almost think like of. a fantasy, huh? Yeah, like you don't think it's happening. <coughs> I, I think of w these things that nobody really prepares you for and you don't know until you're in it. But like when I had to go to the funeral home and when they brought out the paper and it said deceased and had his name, like that wasn't something I was thinking of, but that absolutely was really difficult to see that word I'm next sure. to the person's name. So I'm thinking, especially, you know, parents with their or your children. your husband. I mean, yeah, that was, that's, I mean, how, how you, do you prepare yourself you, for You that? don't. And the, so there's all these little things that grievers go through and, and parents and, and everything they go through when they lose someone. And they want to be heard. They want to tell their story. And and they don't, they don't need to be, uh, they don't need to be coddled. They just need to be listened. And you don't need to fix them. Right. Just let them be and let them be sad. And we have a really hard time with that because we want to make someone feel better. Or we don't know what to say. No. So sometimes you don't got to say anything. No. Sometimes Just listen. No. In fact, someone, this is, I, I tell this story because it's kind of so simple, but um, I remember early on, maybe it was in the first couple of weeks after losing my late husband, I got a text that said from a friend that said, I left something on your front porch. And so I went out to my front porch and there was just a bag of, you know, barbecue chips and, you know, different kinds, a whole bunch of different kinds of potato chips. Right. And I just, for some, I just remember thinking that is the sweetest thing, just yeah. bags of chips. Yeah. It just made me yeah, so, happy. Yeah. She didn't have to say anything. She didn't have to say anything. Just, you know, somebody was there and somebody cared. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it'll be six years in March and I still tell that story of cool. the bag of chips. 
It's just that simple, it's isn't that it? It's simple. So, I mean, yeah, you don't have yeah. to be, you don't have to have words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just a hug or, or just an ear for somebody to say something and, and hey, listen, get over it doesn't work. No. That kind of stuff's about the worst. And one day you'll feel better. Doesn't work. Just no. listen. No. Just be there. And you might know that things can get better, but, you know, it does take effort. It does take work. So and why don't you talk about that? Yeah, and, and that's what I want. That's yeah. <laughs> I want to give. I want to give these parents or kids or grandparents or uncles or aunts mm -hmm. or friends. Mm -hmm. I want to give them some hope. Yeah. How he do we do that? Well, healing and recovery is intentional. We have to be intentional with what we do, and that means there comes a choice. So, like I said, there's a time to to mourn and be in the sorrow uh, and definitely make sure you have that support around you because you really do need that. Then there comes a point where you need to start just reaching your hand out mm -hmm. through the darkness uh, because it's very hard to have to, to get help or for people to know to help you if you're not reaching out because we don't know. Right. We don't know. So the worst thing you could do is? Isolation and keep quiet. Right. That is the worst thing you can do. There is a difference between solitude. Solitude mm -hmm. is reflective mm -hmm. and growing. Isolation mm -hmm. is uh, becoming disattached. In any kind of grief, it's the worst thing you can oh, do. Oh, absolutely. If it's a relationship, if you lost someone because of a disease, mm -hmm. if you lost someone through addiction, if it's suicide, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. the very worst thing you can do is isolate. Oh, right. And sometimes people, you know, often whether it's suicide or, or addiction and overdoses, uh, people f feel like they can't talk about it. They're embarrassed. Mm -hmm. They don't know uh, what people are thinking. People judge their loved one when you know, they don't have all the information. And so in those aspects, people just become very quiet right. and they just try to move through it. Yeah, and the, the sad thing about that is we all get depressed. Mm -hmm. And we have to feel depressed and we have to go through the depression. We can't really allow it to become clinical. Right. Because what clinical depression means is it gets in the way of your life period. Right. You can't go to work. You can't see friends. You, you're antisocial. You're home. You're isolated. And you could become suicidal too. Yeah. So when, if it gets to a point where you cannot get through this grief mm -hmm. and you're isolating and you're that bad, you need to get professional help. Oh, absolutely. Because then it turns into what you call clinical depression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, what your mind starts doing and it becomes – you know, suicide itself is very impulsive. Even if even if someone is contemplating it or even putting in a plan, the actual act to follow through is impulsive. Right. And there is a window to prevent that. But, you know, we keep putting all this pressure on everyone around the person, but that person has to be able to say something because – Mm -hmm. If we if if the loved ones don't know, we're not mind readers. No, we, we don't, don't know and what's going on in somebody's. In, so we could see pain sometimes, yeah, yeah. but we can't we can't see their feelings. Right. We don't know what's really going on in yeah. their heads. And being able to, when I when I work with people, I just tell them this is the place where you you can get dark. Mm -hmm. You can just let that out and say what you're. There is no judgment because anyone who has gone through. Uh, excruciating emotional pain can relate to someone else that is thinking, I don't think I can do this and has right. all those darkness, but people need to be able to feel safe to say it without anyone panicking mm -hmm. and be able to just say, just listen to them. Right. And there is stages of grief. Yes. And well, and, and it's grief is not linear either. I mean, everyone thinks that we're just going to get to this little process and tied with a little bow of acceptance and, would that be cool? Um, it would be amazing, and we wouldn't mm. we would not be having this show right now if right. that was the case because it would exactly. all be done. But you know, I think you know, healing is possible. It is taking steps. It's taking accountability for your loss. Right. And you know, I like to say that your wound. I, this meme was wonderful. Your wound may not be your fault, but healing is your responsibility. Good friend of mine lost her kid mm. out of nowhere. I mean, it wasn't an act. It wasn't an addiction. It was a, a the kid broke her leg and then had a aneurysm or whatever it is and died. And she showed up to work two or three days later. And I remember saying to her, I said, why are you here? And I'll never forget what she said. She says, I miss my daughter. I love my daughter, but life's for the living and I got to live. Mm. 
and I understood that. Mm -hmm. Well, and when we grieve, and grieve, and we all grieve differently, anyway. Well, yeah, and we're not just grieving. Well, you know, our loss. We're grieving what our loved one lost. Mm -hmm. We're grieving what they're not going to now experience. It's very well, and yeah, that well put. is horribly painful. Because we we say to ourselves, "Oh my God, this person had such a good life, and now they're not going to grow up to be to have children, or they're not going to get married, and they're not going to know how good it feels to enjoy life." Yeah. So we have to grieve that too. Absolutely, it's very sorrowful. Yeah. And what's the, what's the stages of grief? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they talk about, uh, you know, I'm kind of conflicted with the stages because... Well, I am too, yeah, but... Because, people, because we're told that, uh, you know, the anger or denial... Uh, acceptance. We're, acceptance, and, sadness, right. we're negotiation, you know. Right, right. Uh, we're, we're taught that uh, when you go through these little stages, you know, that's the appropriate thing to go through and then you'll be done and then that just leaves people feeling like they're doing something wrong because they're like well you know denial like most people if, especially if they've lost their child they're not in denial I mean their child's gone they they are well aware that they're experiencing their loss however um they may have a hard time being able to hear their child's name and see all those things. Right, or sit at a dinner table sit at a and dinner see table. the chair. They call it the empty chair syndrome, yeah. you know? It's It's, it's terrible. And, it is. and now the holidays are coming, mm -hmm. Shelly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And people are really good. This is when people struggle the most, holidays, birthdays. Yeah. Thanksgiving's Reach, yeah. coming. Reach out to your grieving friends because your grieving friends aren't, they, they don't know what to do. So, you know, you can't necessarily wait around for them. So, but you don't have to have a magic formula. Like it could be, you know, dropping off the chips or sending a text, I'm here. Uh, inviting them. Or just a text saying, hey, thinking about you, I love you. Thinking about you, I love you. Inviting them to places instead of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, assuming, oh, I'm not going to invite them because they probably don't want to be around anyone. And that actually happened a lot with me. I had people, like my social circle just kind of dwindled. I didn't well, get people invited. Got, because people got afraid. They didn't yeah, know Yeah, they didn't know it. what to say. I mean, all of a sudden I wasn't going out with couples anymore. Everything just kind of mm -hmm. dwindled. And I had a few close people that were really able to come along and literally beat on my door when they didn't hear from me. Right. I mean, literally, came to the house beating on the door. And also, not only did you have that, you had children. Yes. That you had to allow to grieve too and grieve with them. And they have to be taught how to grieve. That's exactly what yeah. I'm saying. I mean, it's it's something, if we go ahead and we just kind of hide ourselves and isolate and we forget that there's other people. I mean, well, then they learn that it's unnatural to feel bad. Exactly. And they need to know it's okay to cry and it's okay to throw things. And guess what? You're gonna, you're also gonna be okay after that. And it's okay to be angry. Absolutely. It's okay. It's okay to hurt. It's okay. All the feelings are normal and they're all good. And we all grieve differently. Mm -hmm. The same but different. Right. Yeah. You can you can go through everything and think that you got through it all and then start all over again. That's okay too. Yes, but I do want, to, and we'll talk about it when we come back from break. That there is light at the end of the mm -hmm. tunnel, and it's not the train. Or let me change that: there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it doesn't have to be it does the train. Does not have to be the train. Exactly. This is the Action Drug Rehab Hour. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Action Drug Rehab Hour here on your hometown station, ninety-eight point one FM and AM twelve twenty. Shelley, for people that are just chiming in, Shelley is a friend of mine. She is a grief recovery counselor. Um, she's been doing this for quite a while, um, and she's here because I, I needed you to be here to help me because I got so many people. I got grief. I got people dying and grief all around me, I and need um, I needed some expert advice for somebody to help me get some advice out there. So I surely appreciate um, you being here. Well, I really you. do, and, and I want to do more with you. Mm -hmm. I want, um, at Action Drug Rehabs, I want to somehow do a grief group. Mm -hmm. So you and I have to talk, mm -hmm. because um, either that and uh, and online, mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's just that we, we need to uh, give people some hope, man, because when you're going through that pain, you don't have a lot of hope, do you? No, and you, it is, again, it's normal to want to remove that pain when you're going through it, mm -hmm. and and I, you know, if you just look at, Again, like I kind of mentioned before, what leads a lot of people to go into 
addiction and drug abuse. And it is because of unresolved grief and trauma and losses. Exactly. But, but you, sometimes you have to take the drugs and the alcohol away and then you can deal with the grief and the and you, loss yeah. because people have been hiding it for so long. They don't even remember it. Oh, yeah. Or they'll just think, oh, I'm fine. I'm over it. And it's exactly. like, but your, your actions are completely the yeah. opposite of being fine and you over You know, it. when somebody gets first sober, right? Mm -hmm. First thing that happens is a ton of insecurity because they're, they're now, you took away their coping mechanisms, which is their alcohol or drugs, period. So now all these old feelings come up and they become seriously insecure. It could be an old relationship that they haven't been within two years that all of a sudden is like overwhelming them or their grandmother or grandfather that passed away or somebody like that just hits them boom. Right. It's so, an emotional hemorrhage. Yeah. Of, absolutely. And, but to be told, you know, you know, what's more than being told that there's hope. And that is, you know, again, when you do the work with grief and feeling mm -hmm. it and that you don't, you know, recovery means feeling better. Recovery means feeling better. And I look at it as you know, creating a new kind of beautiful. It, things aren't going to be what they were, uh, but they can be different. Mm -hmm. They will be different. And ultimately, you know, we get to own how we want to create something. We may not be able to have what we thought we were going to have, but we can have a new kind of beautiful. And life can be good. And life, life can, be, can good. be great. And we can honor those that we loved and lost. Right, and I, and, I, and I always say this. I believe that if we lost somebody in our lives, they want us still to be happy. Mm -hmm. They don't want us to be sad and, and isolate and miserable and alone. Right. They want us to be happy. Right. And the human experience is to feel, and we are to feel a wide range of emotions and even the scary dark ones. Mm -hmm. But there is absolutely hope uh, with with action to get through right. uh, these horrible situations that we all, there's what, 7 billion something people on the planet? Yeah. All of us will be grieving. Oh yeah, it's this terribly sad part of life is yeah. that part. Mm -hmm. um, what about the persons or people that are listening right now that are at home, they lost their kid mm -hmm. or they lost their wife or their nephew or something like that. Mm -hmm. what, what, how can, what can they do? How can they reach out? What can they do? Well, first, definitely breathe. Um, breathe how you can. Uh, I know when you feel like the waves are just crashing over you and over your head, you're just trying to keep your nose and mouth above the water. And it is to breathe, and it is okay to find uh, support wherever that is, whether it's your church, close friends, uh, professionals, and just say, I need help with this. I need help with this. I mean, we go to the doctor you know, once a year for well checks, right. why aren't we taking that same sort of initiative when it comes to tragedy yeah. in our lives? Our Expe mental our mental health is just as important as our physical health. Because if we don't treat our absolutely. mental health, it becomes physical. Absolutely. It's, it is a complete package mm -hmm. of the physical and mental. Okay. And if somebody wanted to get involved with you, what mm -hmm. is it? I'm just... How, how would they get in contact with you, uh, or what do you do? Yeah, they, I am on Facebook and Instagram, Shelly Zenteno, um, Grief Recovery Specialist. and um, Spell that out. Zenteno? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> oh, yes. I want people uh, to be able to find you. Uh, Z is in zebra, <laughs> E-N-T-E-N-O, and it's Shelly, S-H-E-L-L-E-E, -E, so Shelly Zenteno. Right, and if they call you, I mean, there's things you can do. Absolutely, absolutely, and and if... if you don't have, you, you, you have a magic wand? I don't have, I wish I did. You know what the magic wand is though? Is the phone call. It's the phone is call. Is reaching out. Yeah. And, and let's, and, and there is hope and we, we can do it. You can take back your life. Yeah. It's just, I guess the biggest thing I want people to know is it will get better. Mm -hmm. It can get better. It can. Even yeah. if it's like a snail, you just keep yeah. You going. keep shrugging along and then you, but you got to reach out and you got to want it to get better too. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, the last thing I want to see people do is just um, sit at home and lay in bed and, and 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 fall apart. Right. And sometimes people are afraid to to move forward because they feel letting go of that is letting go of their loved one. When really, it's just learning how to carry them a different way, <laughs> where you can carry them in a beautiful way throughout yeah. your life. Yes. And, and and again, the light at the end of the tunnel is not the train. We know how you feel. We all had to deal with grief. Mm -hmm. And we also know that, you know, pain doesn't heal all. 
but it sure makes it good to it easier to live with, mm -hmm. and we could still have a special and beautiful life. Absolutely, that we could do. We can do that. Yes. All right. Again, how does somebody get a hold of you? And we're you and I are going to do some stuff. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna start up a grief recovery group um, before the end of this year somehow. Mm -hmm. No, if absolutely. you're okay with absolutely. that. Absolutely. I think it'd be wonderful. And uh, we're not going anywhere. Grief is mm. going to be continuing. Uh, and, but it, you know, again, it, it can be exciting to know that there is recovery and there is, there is. Well, look joy. at you. Look how happy you are. What's happened in your life? I mean, I'm. You've got two minutes to tell yeah, us. Yeah, I'm, I'm engaged to an incredible man. How cool is and that? Congratulations. Thank you. High five. High five. And uh, yeah, and, and my kids are doing well. I know. I watch your friends on yeah. Facebook, so I watch all yeah. that. It's Because so, I remember when it all happened, and then I watched you, you, you kind of. Grow up, and right? Grow out Definitely of it growing and, up, yeah. and, and your kids and um, your life become beautiful again. That's just yeah. so. It's cool rediscovering to see. life in a new way, and that doesn't mean that there, you know, aren't still hiccups. But you know, it, again, it's how you look at it and what you choose to do with your life. Right. Awesome. Congratulations Thank on you. your on your new life. I Thank would say. You. How do they get a hold of you again? Uh, you can uh, call me. Uh, 843-619-5555. And uh, yeah, we'll get going. And if you can't find her, find me. I'll find her. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for listening to the Action Drug Rehab Hour here on 98.1 and AM 1220 KHTS, our local hometown station. And I really want to thank... Uh, um, KHTS and every and everyone here at the hometown station Absolutely. for allowing us to do shows like this. It's so important for us to be able to reach out to the people in the community and let them know that there's there's hope. Absolutely. You know. So again, thanks. Um, thank you, Goldman's, and thank everyone here at the KHTS. And we'll be back next week.